Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this, this evening for Southern Pole Hill Drive's ninth TechNet. Uh, I'm sitting here in the Great Smoky Mountains. It was overcast until about one minute ago, and then the bright sun came out, so it's sort of washing out my video. I apologize for that. We're going to have uh, Scott from ARB talking to us tonight about differentials and air compressors. He's out in Washington State. Michael Morrison is uh, going to be joining us also, participating in the discussion. And he's, uh, he's right outside of Asheville, North Carolina, in, uh, in Marion, North, North Carolina. So uh, we're, we're glad you guys joined us again. Uh, Southern Four Wheel Drive continues to be focused on education. COVID came around a few months ago. Our face-to-face -face training had to be stopped. So we, we started this TechNet series. And this is our night. We've talked about tires. We've talked about winches, recovery gear, suspensions, all kinds of things. And tonight, I think you're going to find that, that our topic is going to be, be really good. Scott will tell us all about differentials and air compressors and why they're important, why they're important to tread lightly. I'm going to bring Mike on the screen here, Mike into our show. What's up, Facebook world? Hey, Al, how's it going? I, oh, I'm doing fine. And uh, we'll we'll let Mike pick up here and talk a little bit about the logistics of our show, and we'll get this thing rolling. Awesome. So, hey, guys, just like our other shows, um, let you guys know, tonight we encourage questions. This is a great subject uh, to learn about air compressors, right? Everybody needs air on the trail. If you are practicing tread lightly, it means you're airing down. You got to air those tires back up, which BFG, we talked about that with them. So you got to have a good quality air compressor. And when it comes to air compressors, there's none better on the market than ARB. So we're also going to move into talking about lockers and traction control with them. Um, but as with all of our others, like I was saying earlier, questions, ask your questions this series. Al is going to be keeping up with those. Preface your questions with a Q. And then that way at the end, we can uh, do kind of a Q&A session with Scott and let him tell us a little bit uh, and tell us a little bit about ARB and hopefully answer those questions. Now, for this one right here, um, this week, by commenting, my name is and where you're from, it's going to enter you for a chance to win um, a set of worn gloves and one of the new worn um, recovery connection points, right? The hyperlink. It's pretty cool. It's a new design on the market. Um, I haven't got my hands on one yet, but I'm kind of excited to check that out. So go ahead and comment during the TechNet live stream, right, with your name and where you're from, and that will put you in a drawing for that. And Al is going to slide in how to get entered for your BFG tires drawing uh, here shortly. We're going to hold that one for a little bit. So pay close attention tonight because this, again, is a chance for you to win five BFG tires, whether it's KN3 or KO2 tires up to 37 inches, right? Who doesn't need five BFG tires for the rig? I know I do. I'm raising my hand. Um, but this is another chance. Al will share that a little later in the stream. So you got to be watching the stream to win. And remember, right, that uh, the chance to win will be a Dixie run and you do not have to be present for the drawing. Also, you can sign up as a member at www.sfwda.org to become a member of Southern Four Wheel Drive to win, and that'll give you a chance, another drawing chance um, to become a member of Southern Four Wheel Drive. There's benefits to it, right? All right, so. Mike, thank you. Uh, Dixie Run. Dixie Run's gonna be, a, where is it gonna be this year? Winrock. Winrock, that's gonna be great. Okay, and that's the first weekend of October, right? It is the first weekend of October, and I've little birdie told me that uh, we're going to be there. Well, little birdie told me that you might be there and doing some training too. That's most definitely for sure. We will be there in force doing training. Um, we're going to have some classes and some trail rides. One of my favorite parks on the East Coast is Windrock, so always the opportunity to do some training and and recreating out there. I'm on board. Excellent, thank you, Al. Hey, Scott, how's it going? It's going just fantastic. Thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a long distance uh, trip here. You guys are in the opposite end of the country from us, but uh, we're glad to join. Awesome. Awesome. 
So everyone, this is Scott from ARB. He's been with ARB a long time, but uh, Scott, tell us a little bit about your history. Well, I started out with another differential company and then uh, moved to an, uh, an axle company. And now I'm with another differential company that does a lot of other things. So I've, I've had my finger into this for a while. Uh, a long time wheeler. I've been wheeling now for over 30 years. Started out with a CJ5. Uh, have a couple of Jeeps right now. And uh, this is in my blood. I'm not just selling the stuff. I live this stuff. This, this is what I do. When I identify myself, I identify myself as a, as a wheeler. That's my, that's my identity. That's who I am. That's I'm awesome. The, uh, I'm the Western Regional Sales Manager for ARB. And along with that, I'm also the uh, U.S. Air Locker and Air Systems Product Manager for the U.S. So I have to get my fingers in that those uh, 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 barrels quite a bit playing with those products. Very cool. Very cool. So Scott's got a ton of information, um, a ton of knowledge in his head, not only uh, from the axle locker standpoint, but He's also been in the industry for years and years, almost as long as I've been alive. So the knowledge that he brings to the table is amazing. So what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to start out talking about air compressors because I feel like that's one of the most overlooked um, tools that we carry. And uh, everybody needs one. Right, Scott? Absolutely. And that that leads me to something we talked about a little bit earlier today. Um, um, in 1990, I put on my first onboard air system. And that point, we knew that we were all airing down. We were all running the same tires. We were running 33-inch swampers on everything. All of our CJ5s had 10-inch spoke wheels. And, and if we had a, a limited slip, we were the big dogs. There was, there was no lockers around at that time. I mean, people had them, but very, very few. And I remember this one day, we were at this area, and it was incredibly muddy out. And our group just blew right up the hill. And there were a bunch of guys right behind us. And they struggled and struggled and struggled and finally winched it up. And they got to the top and they said, how did you guys get up here? And we said, well, we're air down to 10. What are you guys at? They were 25 pounds, 30 pounds of air. So that reinforces exactly where we're going with this. Low air pressure, big fat footprints. It's not only easier on the rig, it's easier on your body, it's easier on the environment, and it's it's the way we're all going now. Everybody's airing down. That's the first thing that we should be doing when we get off-road. Air the tires down, bigger footprint, actually less PSI on the ground, so we're practicing tread lightly, not tearing up. One of the most common questions I get, Scott, is, is what air compressor is right for me and my vehicle? And that's a hard one to answer because there's so many different variables that play in, right? That's for sure. We we sell multiple different styles. We have a, a compressor, our mini compressor, the CKSA12. That's basically just for air lockers. You can run both lockers with that. The next step up is our, our medium compressor, the CKMA12. And it's the workhorse. It's the one that's been around the longest as far as that line is concerned. And it's pretty good up to about a 33-inch tall tire. Then you get into the big dog, the twin. That one is, that. that's the one everybody wants. It's uh, 6.16 CFM. And uh, a 37 inch tall tire from 15 to 30 psi in a minute 40. Wow. Um, <laughs> that gets you back on the road quickly. It really does. Yeah. I, I know there's always, after a trail ride, there's that one guy that's got the air compressor that you plug into the 12 volt adapter, and he's there for uh, 30, 45 minutes airing up his vehicle. So, um, you know, and then his air compressor overheats and someone has to kind of step in. So there's some there's some differences in air compressors that a lot of people don't know about, like duty cycles and things like that. How does that play into effect? Well, our twin compressor is 100 percent duty cycle. It's got a, a fan on it as well so that it's helping cooling itself down. Uh, it is on at 135 PSI and 100 off at 150. So we're able to get a good, strong air blast out of it. The other compressors go on at 70 and off at 100. Um, they are 50% duty cycle. It's, it's worth it to know that the duty cycle is an hour. So at a 50% duty cycle, obviously, you're going to be able to operate for 30 minutes out of that hour. Our compressors also have thermal cutoff switches on them. And that's a really important feature to have on, our, on a compressor. When you're out in the woods, you're frequently inflating other people's tires. It, it's just the nature of the beast. We were talking about the guy that has the weak compressor. That guy 
We're always airing him up after we've aired ourselves up. So we're helping him out. Our compressors have this thermal cutoff switch that when they reach a certain temperature, they shut themselves off. Rather than damaging themselves, they shut off. And when they cool off enough, they pop right back on again. So it's, it's kind of a, a way to keep from permanently damaging your compressor. But duty cycle is a big deal. You want to make sure that you're buying the right one for your size tire. When we're talking about the twin, everything you're going to be airing everything up with that. But the smaller size tires, you could get by with the, the CKM A12. Just a standard small single compressor. Uh, now, Absolutely. With the, with the thermal cutoff switch, does that affect where I mount my? Is that affected by where I mount my compressor at all? It is actually because a compressor, by its very nature, is creating heat. It's taking air, it's compressing it, which creates heat, and it's putting out hot air. So if you've got your compressor underneath the hood, it's ingesting hotter air than it would if it were underneath the seat. Now, not everybody has room to put the compressor exactly where they want it, but the good thing about our compressors is everything is going to be quarter-inch NPT as far as going to the air filter. That's just a, a standard pipe thread. So, for example, if you've got it underneath the hood and you're in an area where it's very hot all the time generally you're going to want to open the hood anyway when you're inflating tires but you can also relocate the air cleaners to maybe inside the vehicle to take cooler cabin air the cooler air in the cooler air out and the longer your compressor is going to last before it overheats that's probably being able to relocate uh the intake for the air compressor that's a big deal possibly in like dusty environments and stuff like that as well right it is, and also in water, too. It depends, depending upon where you're taking your rig, uh, there's a lot of people, and I've been down there in, in your neck of the woods and seen some of the water crossings you guys do. Yeah. Uh, think snorkels. <laughs> yeah. And uh, relocate the, the air filters on those just to keep them out of the water as well. Uh, it's not unusual for us to get back an air compressor that uh, a guy is trying to re return for warranty or repair, and he says... I did nothing with it, absolutely nothing wrong with it, and all of a sudden quit working, and we get it here, we tear it apart, and we pour out a quart of water. Yeah, well, that's probably uh, not been a good thing for you. Yeah. So take it, you can relocate those those air intakes to get them up out of the dust and get them up out of the water um, and to pull in cooler air. So when you guys are installing them on your vehicles, that's an important thing to think about. Now, so, so if – with the uh, air compressors in the CFM and we're inflating the bigger tires, we obviously want to run with that 100% duty cycle of the twin. But something like the single, that's up, you had mentioned that's kind of up to a 33 inch tire somewhere in that range. Yeah, we actually advertise it up to a 35 inch tire. I've used those on 35 inch tires and I'm a little skeptical of that. Maybe I'm a little bit uh, fussy on times after having compressors for so many years, but. That's too slow for me. I want I want that I want that tire inflated now. I want to get off that trail when I want to get off the trail, not stand there holding a compressor. Yeah, it's time to it's time to go home and eat dinner. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my manifold burrito didn't hold me over, man. I need to get home to dinner. Yeah, yeah. So what we've chosen the compressor, and you mentioned a little bit about kind of relocating the points uh to air your vehicle up. You guys have a full line of products that kind of covers the ability to relocate kind of plug-in points for the uh, air compressor, right? Uh, that, that's a great question. Yes, we sure do. Um, you're going to find that the twin air compressor, as I mentioned, puts out a lot of heat. We never recommend going directly off the twin compressor with a rubber hose. So, for example, you could put a coupler in the twin compressor, we don't recommend it because it's going to damage most hoses that go there. Um, when you're running air lockers, you're going to be running a manifold kit that uh, allows you to put your solenoids on that on the twin. And we recommend either that or one of our braided stainless hoses to the compressor to a coupler there to allow some of that heat to dissipate so you're not damaging your air hose. That's awesome. So with the twin, I've seen some people where they'll relocate kind of their plug-in points, one on the left side of the vehicle, one on the right. And they'll actually, you know, a husband and wife may start airing up a tire on each side at the same time. Is that, so that's possible with the twin? Oh yeah. We've got our air compressor line. We've got many, many fittings and 
just to go on to the fittings for just a second, once we heard about all the fittings, it was, I was tasked with doing some some research on how to plumb things and so on. So I went to, we didn't have the fittings yet. So I, I went to one of our local wholesalers here and picked up a couple of fittings. And I was shocked at how expensive these fittings were. We're using a, a JIC4 fitting uh, to, to work with all of our braided steel lines. And I went into one of these, these stores and buying at wholesale level, and it was about $9 for a fitting. Uh, now, fast forward, we get all of our fittings in, and they're running about $7.50 a pair for fittings, full list, full retail, $7.50, where wholesale I was paying almost $10. So we, we really came in here with great pricing. We've got plenty, uh, tons of fittings to make it work, uh, tees and all that sort of thing. So you could easily go from under your seat to a T fitting to under both doors or through the cowl or wherever you want to go to each bumper. Uh, we have really nice couplers as well as caps for the couplers to keep all the debris out of the caps. Um, couplers on bumpers, that's a great place to have them. But my, I don't know about you, but my bumpers are frequently under mud and I want to make sure I'm keeping those couplers clean. So the caps for those. So we have a full assortment, six different sizes of braided steel lines from 11 inches all the way up to just a little bit over nine feet. And the, the pricing is very good. It's really worthwhile to take a look at it, but it gives you that freedom to put them where you want to put them. Awesome. Um, so one of the other questions that I get quite a bit is um, your guys' twin portable kit comes with the air tank. If I'm not running the portable kit, at what point in time would I want an air tank on my vehicle? Really, an air tank is only going to get you any kind of benefit if you're using a charge for an air tool. Air tool is really the only thing that you're going to utilize it for. Now, that being said, you could use it and get a little bit of a boost um, when you're doing the, the first tire or maybe a little bit of buildup between the first and the second tire. But overall, it doesn't really significantly in, uh, affect your inflation times by having a tank. Now, a big tank maybe could help you, but the, the tanks that you're going to see on, a, on an off-road rig, it's really not going to help much. And, and think about even your shop compressors. If you're running something that, that takes a lot of air like a, a DA or, or a grinder, um, once you get that thing running, it's not going to shut off again until you shut the tool off. And that's very much the same way with a compressor for t tires. Once it's running, it's not going to shut off again until you're done inflating, even with a tank. Yeah. So really, ultimately, only if I want to run air tools, do I need to worry about installing an air tank? That's correct. Now, one thing with compressors, they've got to have power, right? So we always kind of, when we're finished up a trail ride, we see the one guy, he doesn't crank up his vehicle and he's running the compressor. Compressors draw a lot of energy, so they really need to have the vehicles running in order so that the alternator can keep up with the compressors, right? Yeah, uh, it's funny you ask because we've just had some customers calling about that recently, but that twin compressor, when it's running and it's inflating a tire, um, it is drawing 67 amps. Wow. That's going to suck down the average battery pretty darn quick. So you really do want that compressor running. And it's funny, we have a machine here that we can, that's, that's 110 powered and we can, we can tune it down to 14 volts, which is about where your car is going to run with, uh, with the alternator. And you can actually play with it different voltage and you can hear the compressor making different sounds or, or sounding different as the voltage changes. It's, it's amazing how much difference it makes. Is there any, kind of consideration in between kind of having a cheaper battery in your vehicle, like the one that comes in it from the dealer versus like a, like a high end AGM battery or anything like that, as far as compressor performance. I think it does make a little bit of a difference. Um, the, the higher rated batteries are going to give you a little bit more boost, but, but I think we have to maybe take a step further towards that is that you want that big battery, not just for that compressor, but you're going to want that when one of your other expenditures comes into play, the winch. And so, so you're not just buying it for a compressor. You're buying it for the complete system. Um, I tend to want to buy once, uh, go one step forward and stay that step forward rather than two steps forward and then one step back. So I'm, I'm going to buy the right part the first time rather than spending money on, on something weaker like that. Buy the good AGM battery out of the box. You'll never have problems with them. Awesome. Awesome. Very cool. Now, um, there was once I was using, um, 
we'll call it an inferior compressor. Uh, but we were out west in Utah. It was colder climate. This compressor did have a built-in kind of air tank, but it was very cold. And uh, the compressor actually, uh, one time we went to air up and we couldn't get it to work. And I'm, it was frozen. What kind of causes and what kind of maintenance um, things do we need to look at with our compressors on our vehicles? I can't say that I've ever seen seen one of our compressors have a problem with cold. I think about the lowest temperature I've ever had mine at has probably been in the six, seven, eight range, something in that range, and I've never had any issue with it. Now, I don't really know how to address that. I've just not seen cold weather issues with a compressor, nor with air lockers for that matter. So it, it's just not been a concern. Awesome. So I should have had an ARB for that trip. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. But let's let's step back on that wiring for just a second. Um, we'll get customers that call up and have questions about blowing fuses on on their compressors, and that's it, we use a forty amp maxi fuse on both the single a single compressor and the twin. The twin uses two forty amp maxi fuses. If you've seen those, they're a big, about an inch and a half wide fuse. They're a big big fuse. Um, usually, if you're seeing a, a blown fuse, you've got a bad connection. Now, something that we found a couple of times is where, especially on the Jeep JK, this, this is a prevalent problem with the JK, is that you're able to get that battery cable very, very tight to the cable itself, but the battery cable itself is not very tight to the post. And once you've cured that problem, you'll frequently cure the problem with the blown fuse. It is usually a bad connection, and it's usually caused by battery terminals themselves. Awesome. Awesome. So with these compressors, what type of maintenance items do we need to look at? I, I really teach people, you know, doing your vehicle 360 before you go out on the trail, go ahead and go through kind of your pre-check items, checking your winch and things like that. What type of maintenance things do we need to keep a, keep an eye on with our compressors? Well, that the the pre trip maintenance is a is a very big deal, and I don't think we pay nearly enough attention to it. Uh, the the air filters, I would check them after every dusty ride. If you're if you're not in dust, if you're up playing in the snow, you're playing elsewhere. That's not a big deal. But dust and any time you could possibly get any mud in it, you're definitely going to want to check it. It's got a centered centered bronze filter on it that is really high quality. You you're going to have a hard time plugging it up, honestly, the way it operates. But it, it, it flows a tremendous amount of air. I've seen them plugged a couple times, but just do your maintenance on that. And, and Mike, you've made a great point. Check your vehicle out before you go out. Um, you touched on winch, and I'm, I'm going to take my, my, take my A or B hat off for a moment <laughs> and put on my Wheeler hat. Try your winch before you leave your house. Those solenoids can get rusted up. There's corrosion that can get in them. Use the winch before you need it, because when you yeah. need it, it may not be there. So yeah. I can put my air back on now. <laughs> awesome. So you guys use, um, and you've shown me before, I believe, at one of the Overland Expos, that bronze filter. A lot of other ones will just use like a little foam filter that kind of goes into place. There's a big difference between that, right? Your filters can just be washed off with those foam filters. You pretty much have to replace that, don't you? Oh, you do, and they they turn into junk pretty quickly. Uh, I would recommend changing them out for something else. And if you can figure a way to do a remote filter, find some other way because they do draw a tremendous amount of air. It doesn't matter what compressor you're talking about; it, it draws a lot of air. And you want to make sure that you're not not uh, uh, strangling the compressor by not getting enough air to it. So a good filter is worth it. I, I would imagine that if you're if a compressors really having to struggle to pull air in it's probably pulling a whole lot more amperage than it normally would as well definitely it, it definitely will pull the maximum that's that's capable it will every time awesome awesome so we've talked a lot about compressors is there anything else that we should really know before we move on to lockers about compressors well, you do, you do want to get the one that's right for you. You want to make sure that you're you're routing things correctly. Um, you're trying to keep it as cool as you can. Under the hood is is an okay place. I'd prefer to have it in the cab if possible. But there's also considerations there. Not everybody has the room, so you pretty much have to put it where it works best for you for your application. But keep it clean. Make sure that you've got your all your fittings tight. 
you've uh, you've got your filters up and out of the way that they're not going to get splash on them. I've got flat fenders on two of my Jeeps where I can throw a lot of mud up and I have to really pay attention to where that mud is going. So I've got relocated filters. So we've got to pay attention to it just like your face. You can't be sucking mud in and expect to live. Same thing with your compressor. You got to make sure that you're, you've got some clean air coming into it. Awesome. Awesome. And clean air has got to get into your vehicle too. There's another snorkel one. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. All right. So next up on the list, guys, we're going to talk about lockers, right? And I'm sure a lot of you are here waiting to hear about lockers. But one of the most important things, you know, if you've if you've got an air locker is you got to have a compressor. So that's why we started with that. But we're going to let Scott kind of tell us a little bit about when to use lockers, when do you need lockers and when not to use lockers and kind of the benefits of choosing an air locker versus some of the electric lockers on the market or even you know I, you've heard me probably talk about some of the OEM lockers out there and the failure points with those what's the benefit of having an air locker over some of those OEM electric lockers so Scott tell us about when we would use a locker over some of the other um, things when when on the trail would we use a locker well, there are many, many times, and, and if you've used lockers in the past or, or been around them, you'll see that there are multiple times that you need them. But the time that you really want to use them is the time that you need to make that obstacle in one pass, one pass only. For example, go to Mo Moab, some of these hills that you're looking at, they're the, oh my gosh, I never want to have to back down that hill. So you want to use every tool in your toolbox. There are quite a few times that you want to do that. For example, you're in a trail that's quite muddy, for example. Um, if you go through that hole in just straight four-wheel drive, you may not make it. If you don't make it, putting in four-wheel or put it locking the lockers up, you may not get out. Um, I figure to use a locker the same way that I recommend using four-wheel drive. You want to be in four-wheel drive before you need four-wheel drive, and you want to be locked up before you need to be locked up. Awesome. To me, so, to me that's the crucial part. Yeah. So really, I, being able to look down the trail, identify your line, and make a plan, and knowing that you need your locker ahead of time is a good practice on the trail, right? Yes, it is. And, and the other part of this is, is that after doing this a while and, and seeing a lot of newbies come into the sport, a lot of people are getting vehicles that have factory lockers and right out of the box, they're using lockers pretty much from the beginning of the trail to the end of the trail. I'm not a big fan of that. I, I would rather you use a locker when you need it, not all the rest of the time. But that being said, I told you, or I recommended that you use the locker when you're, when you need to have that locker that is that you use all the tools in the toolbox at the same time. I recommend that you not use your locker in a lot of cases where you can try some things out so you can learn how to pick your lines. You can learn how to wheel without the locker so that when you do need the locker, you're actually able to be far more capable with it. And that's one of the drawbacks we have now with people jumping in straight in from the, the new car, grabbing at something that's got the lockers. They haven't learned how to wheel yet. They haven't learned how to pick that line. And there's a huge difference. We've all seen people out there struggling with their lockers in and then see the guy with open diffs just walk right through it like it wasn't anything. You, you've got to learn how to use your line or to pick your lines. And by having a selectable locker, an air locker on there, you're able to use that locker to learn. Use the locker when you need it, but then turn it off when you don't need it to learn how to pick those lines. Yeah. So. One of the problems that we've seen um, from drivers and one of the stories we get back, kind of the horror story, you know, people go out west where you guys have tons of kind of public lands out there and they're using the lockers and running the lockers and they get a long ways out. But basically the vehicle is out driving their capabilities. Right. So they've used the locker to allow themselves to get somewhere way too far away. And then something fails on some of these OEM lockers. They they can't get it to engage or they can't get it to disengage and they're stuck miles and miles away from help. Um, and then they're having to be rescued. This is a, this is a horror story that we've heard quite a bit. So I really like that you're saying, you know, learn how to drive without it before using it. That's awesome. 
Yeah, there, there was a story. Uh, there's a place in uh, uh, California that is known as Fordyce Creek, and it's it's one of those destination wheel, wheeling areas that everybody wants to go to. Um, and I was up there wheeling one time, and, and uh, there was a guy on the tri- trip that had a, a stock Rubicon. This is a TJ, and it really doesn't matter what it was because the, the same uh, results would have happened. The guy had broken an axle shaft, and he continued on because he had – Semi-float axles without C-clip, kept on because he was on the trail, knew he had three legs now because he had a locker up front, so he kept going. And it ended up breaking the other axle in the back. So now he's only got front drive, he's got axles broken in the back, and they're trying to get the axle shafts out. They tried every trick in the book. The uh, PVC pipe in there with a welder trying to, to sting it, stick it on the end, yard it out, they couldn't do it. They ended up actually taking a, an entirely new axle housing down there, assembly down there, and changed it out so the guy could drive out. The end of the story is the guy could not get those axle shafts out. Once he had the thing in the shop, he couldn't get the shafts out. He had to cut the differential out with a plasma cutter. He had oh done so much God. Wow. So he, he needed everything new at that point. But that, that kind of goes with it. This doesn't really have anything to do with, with – uh, um, uh, using all the tools, but stuff happens, man. And you got to be prepared for it. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. So a, another very common issue, and again, not kind of throwing any brands under the bus, but a lot of these OEM electronic um, lockers, they get kind of frozen, either engaged or you can't get them uh, to disengage. Very, very, very common problem. Kind of explain to us a little bit about the differences between a, an e-locker and the ARB air locker. Well, first of all, I think that we have to understand that there's a difference between a, a true aftermarket locker and an OE locker. The OE locker is designed around X platform. So let's use a Jeep JK, for example. It's designed around either a two-door or four-door. It has one engine choice. It has two transmissions it can choose from, for the most part, two transfer cases, a basic weight, and tire size. Anything beyond that, they're going to void your warranty. That's how it is. They're going to void your warranty on it. When when we build a Dana 44 air locker, I have no idea what it's going to go into. It could go into a Samurai that's got Toyota axles or 44s. It could go into a... um, Uh, a three quarter ton pickup truck that drives a camper everywhere and it's on the front axle. I have no idea where it goes. So I have to build that thing to make it the strongest component in the axle assembly. Our, our air lockers are stronger than the ring and pinions and the axle shafts. If you took a Dana 44 and did a 35 spline upgrade, it's still going to be stronger than those axle shafts or the ring and pinion. We have to make it that way. One of the things that we've done, we have a patented process called the timed locking mechanism. And what that does is it locks your gearing internally, your pinion gears inside, also known as spiders. It locks them in the optimal position for strength. Now, let's let's go away from the locker for a second and look at differentials. Differentials, if you look at the gears, you're gonna, you should know that a 373 gear set is far stronger than a 488 or 538 gear set. The pinion gear is far larger, and there's far more tooth contact because that pinion gear is longer or is larger. The tooth contact is what we're talking about here. So when we lock our air locker up, it has the strongest position for that tooth contact. Now, why is that so important? If you think about the air locker, if you look at its design, you're going to see that our locking collar is on the ring gear side. That means that when we lock this thing up, the, the clutch inside of it, the clutch gear locks the side gear up on the side of the the ring gear. And you can see that on the the exploded view there. You're gonna see that clutch gear. But that means that only the ring gear side axle is physically locked up by that clutch gear. That's what's locking it up. The other side or the right rear side in in a rear application is locked up because the pinion gears can't move because the side gear is locked on that left side. The pinion gears can't move. That means the side gear on the right-hand side is locked up. Now, we're at Moab. We've got 39-inch tall tires. We've got six PSI. We're bouncing on a ledge. And all that torque is going through that set of spider gears. The entire torque load of that right axle is going through all those spiders. 
I need to make sure that those spiders have the maximum tooth contact and not so I don't peel a gear off. That's how we're able to get, give you a five-year guarantee on that locker. We do not see torn up spider gears. The axle shafts and the ring and pinions are going to be the failure points. That's awesome. So, so going back to the electric lockers for a second or the factory lockers, they're building them around cost. They have to. They're, they're trying to save money. And you think that what's a dollar? Well, over a vehicle that's got a lifespan of two million vehicles, a dollar is a lot of money. So if they're able to save a little bit of money by not making it any stronger than it needs to be and only building in a certain amount of built-in failure room, then they're, they're money ahead. We're an aftermarket company. We're, we're making it so that it can be as strong as it can possibly be. It's a lot different than supplying a, 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 an, a, an OE locker. Now, talking about the engagement times a little bit, our pressure to engage the locker is about 600 pounds on that clutch gear. By the time you go through the small orifices and all that, and that, that, that airlines uh, narrow down to that little tiny stream, it's about 600 pounds of pressure that's locking that clutch in. We can lock our air locker in at any speed. As long as we don't have significant wheel speed differential, we can lock that locker in. Meaning the king of the hammers guys can come off the desert at 100 miles an hour, slam the brakes on a little bit and hit the rocks and the, and the air locker button and drive up the, the hill. If you look at what the OE manufacturers are telling you and the other, other lockers on the market, they're going to want less than five miles per hour of speed so you can lock that so you can lock that locker up and in the OE world you can't even lock them in high range in most cases it has to be low range and we all know that there are a lot of times that you're playing you want to be in high range and you want that locker to work the locker isn't going to work in low range in most OE applications yeah i think that's super important the the engagement time too because um and the engagement speed i know with a lot of the OE lockers out there that when you go to engage them you know, you've almost got to be at a stop and then you go to disengage them after you've used them. And especially if you're using them correctly, engage and disengage quite a bit on the trail, you've got to back them up. And sometimes you've got to back up 25, 30 feet. And here on the East Coast, that's not always possible. And I'm sure out West, there's times where there's, that's not possible also without ending back up on another obstacle. So that that that's engagement, disengagement speed is important. One of the other things... Yeah that I think is very important to kind of bring up is, you know, in the past, you've told me that the ARB air locker actually defaults to being open. If, if you have a problem, I've seen where some of these OE lockers and things like that, you know, they get stuck in place and they're engaged and guys are having to drive them home. Guys and gals are having to drive them home engaged, but with the ARB, they automatically disengage if an airline gets broken or something like that. Correct. That's correct. You're, you're never going to worry about that. Now, there are some customers out there that say, I want it, I want it to default to locked up. OK, let's let's play that scenario. So all of a sudden you're on the highway with your Jeep JK, JL or TJ that has no locking hubs up front and your front airline shears and all of a sudden your locker locks up. That is a recipe for disaster. Yeah, yeah. So you're at, you're overloading that differential quite a bit at that point in time, and it's going to be hard steering for a while, right? If you can steer at all, and, and we're all used to the way our vehicles drive. And if you change that steering, for example, if you were to cut your steering power steering ho or power steering belt um, on the highway and try to steer, that's what you're going. It's going to feel like, and it it could very seriously cause a, a problem. So anyway, we default to the open. Most most manufacturers do, but driving these things if they're stuck locked is not fun. Not fun at all. Yeah, yeah, that can be a rough. That's when you really got to make sure you got those thumbs out on the steering wheel. <laughs> yes. you, you you bring up a point though about being locked up, and and there's always a question that goes out there, which if I've got if I've only got the money to lock up one axle, which am I going to do? Um, I, I have had the misfortune of coming home on only a rear axle and only a front axle a couple of times. We won't go into those details, but it's happened. And I can tell you with absolute certainty that I'd much rather come home with only a rear axle than with only a front axle. Now, if you think about your vehicle, that your vehicle as you're 
climbing, all your weight is going to that rear tire. Your, your traction is all in the back end. When was the last time you had to really struggle and, and work to go down a hill? Not very often. But up yeah. a hill, it's a different story. Now, that's not to say there aren't certain cases where you may want to have that front locker first. But as a rule of thumb, I always recommend getting the rear locker first. Or if you only can do one, do the rear. Yeah, so having that rear locker. Now, a lot of people with like independent front suspension, they are very afraid of putting a locker in the front due to you know that, that kind of weaker clamshell differential design. But if you're driving properly and you're using the locker just when you need it and then disengaging it, probably don't see that many failures, even with IFS front suspension, right? Yeah, you've you've got to realize, I guess, that by having lockers, you can wheel far more elegantly. Now, by that, I mean, you don't have to thrash through it as much. Certainly, there are going to be times you have to, but having no lockers or having only one locker, there are going to be times that you're going to have to work harder than if you had them both ends. Therefore, you have more chance of breaking parts open than you do locked up. Yeah, you have to pay attention to what you're doing up front. You do have to do that, especially with a clamshell. But overall, you can keep things surviving longer because you don't have to press the vehicle as hard. All right. So, you know, we've we've shared a lot about air compressors. We've shared a lot about lockers. If we're looking you know, kind of lockers and, and we're kind of on the fence. What are some things that that uh, that you can share with us, you know, about lockers that maybe we haven't covered at this point? Well, there have been a lot of automatic lockers that have been in the market and I, I've sold them. I've, I've sold that type of product. And the automatic locker has certainly had its place, but not not so much today. Um, maybe if your vehicle is a um, uh, off-road only vehicle. It's it's a one-use product. It's the only time you use it is when you throw it on the trailer and go on the trail. That's probably not a, a, something bad to consider. It's something certainly worthwhile to think about. But when we're seeing dual-purpose vehicles that we're driving now, is you want to have that that locker be invisible when you're on the street. You don't want to even know it's there when you're driving on the road. Where an automatic locker is going to give you a lot of feedback, especially short wheelbase stick shift vehicles. There is nothing worse than feeling that in there when you're shifting gears. Um, story with that is I had one in the back of my CJ5. I had 35-inch uh, boggers on the Jeep. I had punched a hole in a bogger, so I had put a brand new one on it, and it happened to be on the rear axle with another tire that was about 75%. So automatic lockers, they will stay locked up until the outside tire needs to unlock, but when they're different circumference, they're locking and unlocking at all sorts of times. Now, couple that with a long-legged T18 uh, Granny Gear 4-speed. My wife took the Jeep up to the store, came back, threw the keys at me, and said, I'm never driving that sucker again. <laughs> so it does have some drawbacks. <laughs> A yeah. uh, selectable locker is something that, that is, it, it's here to stay. It is your choice now. You, and an air locker is a great portion of that because we can be stronger. We're aftermarket. We've got a hundred something applications of this thing and we're developing new applications every single day. It's not just for, for your, your off-road rig. It's also for your tow rig. We're making a ton of those for the Dodge Rams and, and Fords, all sorts of different applications. So we've got pretty much got you covered. That's awesome to hear. Well, Scott, I think uh, we've got the opportunity here to kind of answer some questions. And I, But one of the first questions that we had come up, one of the first questions got, what airline, this is from VB Tom, what airline is best to use to go from the air compressor to the air tank and from the air tank to the lockers? We're not generally going from the air tank to the lockers. We're usually... Uh, going from the manifold that is with the twin compressor or the, the manifold that's on the single itself. The twin compressor requires a manifold. I touched on that that briefly just because you have to be able to put the solenoids on it. But you're going to want to have something braided steel that goes between the compressor and the manifold. And then from the manifold on, you can pretty much use whatever works best for you. As I oh, mentioned, we Alan, do have a we few options, him? but you're, you're not limited there because by the time it gets the manifold, the airline has cooled off. 
Um, we do have a very Al, high temperature line now with our, our black airline you're seeing out there. Did so we lose you Scott? don't really have to worry too much about that as far as routing it. Um, people do get concerned at some times about having an airline and, hey, I'm going to rip it out. Well, my counter is how often do you rip out your brake lines? If you're not ripping out brake lines, you shouldn't be ripping out airlines because you should be routing them with your brake lines and keeping them safe. Awesome. All right. This is from Doug Callis. Does moisture build up in the compressor? I've noticed moisture will come out when airing up uh, with my ARB. It's not necessarily building up in your compressor. It's building up in your airlines and your intake because the air compressor is doing just that. It's compressing air. And depending upon where you are and the amount of humidity you have in the air, it's going to suck that air in with that moisture and condense it. So instead of just being light air molecules, it's going to come out as droplets. So you're, you're taking that humid air, compressing it, and it's going to come out as droplets. You can minimize some of that, too, by remote mounting your filters into the cab air because it's usually not as humid inside, depending upon your situation, obviously. Um, but you can keep it, minimize it that way. Yeah, we, we know all about humidity here on the East Coast. <laughs> humid, here is, or humid here is about 40%. Yeah. Unless it's raining. Yeah. All right. Um, so we've got a guy here that's brand new, Chuck Hepburn, and um, he said he's a very big newbie. So he said, explain exactly kind of what lockers do. When you're off road, um, your four wheel drive system is feeding your front and rear axles and your open differentials by their by their design are designed to navigate around a corner because if they were simply like a garden tractor every time you turned a corner you'd be chirping a tire so the differential is allowing the tire on the outside or inside for that matter for them to do just what it says differentiate it allows them to go around that corner at different tire speeds so what we're doing in this case is we're locking that axle up so those tires are perfectly locked with with one another and they're both going the same speed all the time. The, the downfall to an open differential is that when you're in a position where you have low traction um, and a lot of people remember this from their high school days, maybe taking somebody's car off the road, that you got the right tire is on something slippery and the left tire is on something perfectly perfect traction, but you're not going anywhere because that right tire on the slippery surface is just spinning. All the torque of the differential goes to the side with the least amount of traction. So all your traction goes to that open side. So that tire that's on the ground and has perfect traction does absolutely nothing. We want to be able to get by that by having the differential locked up all the time, or when I shouldn't say all the time, but fully locked when we want it to be locked. So that tire that has the traction is still able to drive the vehicle, and the tire with the with no traction doesn't really have any effect on whether you're going anywhere or not. Uh, does that yeah, make sense? That's, that's a, <laughs> the best explanation I've heard. So um, next question, same thing from kind of Chuck Hepburn. OEM versus kind of aftermarket, which one is better? And what I would kind of adjust that question with, because we already answered it, is is when should I upgrade my OEM lockers to like an air locker? I'm going to be a realist here. And, and until you really have a failure or you're upgrading your axle shafts, I say if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Now, that that being said, that especially in the Jeep world, people upgrade their axle assemblies all the time. and I feel that I would rather sell my good stuff when it's still good and get top dollar out of it than have it be junk and sell it and have to sell it at a bargain. So if, for example, I have a Rubicon, I know I'm going to go, I want a stronger axle assembly, I would sell it with those axles in a good working condition. So I'm getting good money out of it so I can upgrade and use that money for the parts I want that work better for me. Uh, we make a, a, a locker for the Jeep JK that is known as our RD-157. The only application for that locker is Jeep JK's Rubicon replacement. That's the only function for it. And you have to buy 35 spline axle shafts when you buy it. There's some reasons behind that that I won't go into, but, but that is a replacement locker. That is either number six or number seven on our overall locker sales numbers. And that is only for an application that comes factory with a locker. We are doing a lot more with these vehicles than the original equipment manufacturers ever designed them for. If they did, they'd be a lot more expensive. That's for sure. 
<laughs> imagine a, a Jeep being a whole lot more expensive than it already is, right? So it's hard to imagine. Well, so that's our last question, but most definitely, Scott, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule um, and thanking ARB for kind of g- giving you the opportunity to do this, to come out to help Southern Four Wheel Drive continue our TechNet series and continue kind of our mission to educate everyone. I want to encourage everyone to check out ARB, go check out their uh, website, see what they've got to offer. It's a whole lot more than just air compressors and lockers. They've got full range of camping gear, recovery gear. As a four-wheel drive trainer, I rely heavily on a lot of ARB components, and I can verify that it holds up and it works very well. Um, But thanks a ton for coming out. Um, One thing I want to share, the lucky winner from last week, Um, The great prize was Chuck Hepburn from Morristown, Tennessee. He received the free subscription to Carta Tracks and a pair of worn heavy-duty recovery So, Chuck Hepburn, congratulations. Um, Also, I want everyone to know that once Chuck uh, won, he also went and became a premium member for Southern Four Wheel Drive. So, that's a huge uh, benefit to Southern Four Wheel Drive. But, Scott, thanks a ton for your time. Um, Any kind of parting words of wisdom to share with everyone before we jump off? Well, one thing I want to to make sure that everybody is aware of is that I am very happy to answer questions. If you have additional questions or you think of them later, get with Al or Mike and have them relay the questions to me. I'll be very happy to answer them. We all have questions. Nobody knows everything. I certainly don't know all of it, but I'm certainly willing to go find the answers for you the very best I can to give you something that, that might help you. But I want to thank everybody for their for your time. I've enjoyed myself immensely. And uh, keep the keep the shiny side up and tread lightly. Awesome. Yeah. I couldn't have said it better myself, guys. So go outside, adventure, get on the trail, make sure that you, you know, like, subscribe, share this video with everybody. Like I always say, share it with mom, dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, dogs, hairdresser, whoever you got to share it with, share it so that we can get the word out there. Thanks a ton, Scott. Always great to spend time and kind of talk with you and uh, everyone else. We'll see you on the trail. Thank <laughs> you.